Hey everyone, welcome to another Mass Transit Live video. Might be the last one of the year, we're at you know the 30th and I'm gonna avoid any 2020 references, although it's been a great year from a Mass Transit perspective as far as growth, it's, yeah, it's, it's crazy. I think we're all gonna wave goodbye to 2020 and, and not even look back. But anyway, um, I wanted to come on a little bit, kind of take a break. Season two is kind of wrapped up. Um, this is just kind of an interlude, kind of an intermission. Uh, I don't think there's anything left on the state machines to go over. I pretty much covered everything. So I'm gonna call that one good and think about season three at this point. Um, hopefully that'll kick up in January. Um, but I wanted to just kind of go over some things. You know, we've done a lot of work in mass transit lately. 7.1 was just released over the weekend, followed quickly by a 7.1.1 with a new feature called uh, Kill Switch, which is something I've been working on for a while. In fact, 7.1, the biggest thing about it was getting it in place to where I could start and stop the bus so that I could actually make the Kill Switch work. So uh, I'm just going to go over kind of some of the things. The release notes are there. Restarting the bus is definitely the biggest item. Uh, and especially now with container-based setup and services, people want to be able to stop the bus without having to reconfigure it and trying to get an instance in a container back in was really the main driver for this. It's like, okay, I have iBus control in the container or iBus depot with the ASP.NET and I want to be able to stop it and then restart it. So now that totally works. It works with all transports. Rider support was added in as well. Um, there were a couple fixes around that, but so far, everything is working great, and it's really easy to just say, hey, things aren't in a good space. We want to stop the bus, so now we can do that. Um, and that's great. Uh, the other big change with 7.1, which wasn't big, 99% of the code is going to compile without issue, um, but the request client with multiple response types, anybody who's watched some of my videos where I go into the request client knows that I just it sucked. It was a bad experience. It was like doing all this tuple matching and is completed successfully and looking at tasks and it was just way too sucky. I can't think of a better way to put it. So with, uh, with 7.1 I've changed the response type for multiple responses. You have two ways to do it. You can use just the response that comes back which has two or now three generic arguments because I added a third one because someone asked why not three and I thought why not three? Sounds great. Um, but now with the response type is you can just use, it looks like pattern matching under the covers. The compiler is doing exactly the same thing, except it's actually cleaner because we aren't degrading ourselves with object, but it's just saying if response is a or response is B and it's a lot cleaner. It gives you just sort of an if else kind of syntax. Uh, I'm really happy with it. I think it's a better way to go for people who really want to use language pattern matching. Great. We have you covered there too. You can actually just cast it, cast, specify an explicit type for the response to response, which has no generic arguments whatsoever, which means you're gonna be going through object, uh, but it uses deconstruction to cast to two different parameters. So you can do things like case um, ignore comma response A. The first argument is actually just the response, um, but you can't pattern match on a single thing. You can't deconstruct a one type. That's basically like implicit conversion. So it doesn't work that way. Uh, so you have to put it as a tuple. Um, so under, under bar comma response A, under bar response B, and it even works in the switch syntax for expressions. So all of that works. Um, again, you're just going through object at that point and letting the compiler's pattern matching do the work, but um, a little cleaner thing, it's great. Um, another thing that I encountered with the request client that was it's about communicating intent. The request client, you know, somebody asked, how come I can't, you know, it was a long thread on the issues and I don't remember the issue right off. It was a long thread about why don't I know all these types in advance and why do I have to specify them and why can't I pattern match on return? And this whole conversation started up of, you know, why do I have to know types? Well, .NET is a typed language and mass transit is a typed dispatch system. So if messages are coming back and you don't know the type, it isn't going to give you object. Um, so that's what kind of kicked off this whole spinneroo. And one thing that I learned about it is I added a new response type to a consumer and it broke my client because the response coming back wasn't recognized by the client and therefore it was not completing the request. And so I tried to think of a way that we could handle that better. And what I did is I make it so now the request client actually adds a header to the request that includes all of the valid message types that are accepted. 
So for instance, if I can accept order canceled and order not found, <clears throat> you know, I can have those different types. And then the original consumer, you know, only supports those type. Well, so let's say we, we ship that, we have the client shipped. And now we add a new response type called order already shipped, meaning you can't cancel it, but it's providing more detail. It's saying, hey, you can't cancel your order, but it's on the way. Awesome. You know? um, so to, in order to do this, the consumer needs to do some backwards compatibility checking. And rather than version the contract, it just adds a new response type. <clears throat> this allows it to check and say, hey, does the response get accepted by the client? And if it is, then I'm going to send that order already shipped. Otherwise, I'm going to throw a fault and make it go through a request fault because I can't, you know, the order, you know, the other two response types don't matter, but I want to be able to be compatible with that client. And I also don't want that client sitting around until the timeout. So by passing it a fault, it's saying, hey, you know, the order's already shipped. You can no longer cancel it. And, you know, the order was found, but there was a problem canceling it. And it's, it just provides, and you could do other things that you wanted to, but that was just the example here. But it lets the consumer recognize that, I have new capabilities, but downstream clients don't have them. Um, yeah, so that, that was kind of a thing that, you know, I think made a lot of sense, especially from versioning code over time. So that was one that I hit. Um, there wasn't a whole lot else thrown in there. There were a couple new things with container integration. Um, one of the big questions that always came up is like, hey, if I don't configure endpoints with all my consumers, and I filter out certain ones, I want to be able to add, connect those to receive endpoints later. How can I resolve those consumers? Um, so we actually added a I receive endpoint connector to the container now. And now if you resolve that, you can call connect receive endpoint and you get the same kind of configuration uh, syntax that you get for a bus configurator uh, to be able to call configure consumer, things like that. So all of the consumer definitions and all the things that would apply to the receive endpoint work when you're doing a connect receive endpoint. So pretty handy, pretty useful. Um, yeah, so that was 7.1, stop, start the bus, request client changes. We did some underlying core changes to how riders are connected and started up, and so that's all done. Um, but the big thing in 7.11 was the kill switch. And the way I would describe the kill switch, even just looking at the documentation is, you know, it's like a circuit breaker, but for messaging. It's basically, you can think of the production line in the factory where everything's rolling down and, you know, suddenly parts start falling off the line or Joe gets, you know, stuck behind a machine and, you know, we don't want him getting crushed by a robot. So you've got that big giant red button that says, hey, hold the line. Anything we're pushing down now is just going to fall off the line and break. And mass transit's always had a circuit breaker through green pipes, but you know, it's the number one way to fill your error queue with messages because if it's just going to say, okay, well, the service is down, so I'm just going to return the same exception that happened before, the transport is very quick at moving messages from the queue to the error queue when the exception is already thrown. So definitely something I would never use in production, uh, but by having the kill switch there, you have the same behavior and same configuration as a circuit breaker, but it's the messaging analog. It's saying, hey, if this consumer is failing constantly on this endpoint, stop the endpoint. There is no reason to keep processing. We're basically screwed at this point. Market is unhealthy. The entire service goes into a degraded state, which your monitoring tools can pick up and say, hey, what's going on? And then you can see, look at your error rates and say, oh, wow, we were getting a ton of errors before this endpoint was killed. Uh, so it gives you a way to kind of prevent yourself from you know, having that job where you're gonna go move 250,000 messages from your error queue back into the processing queue because you chewed through it super quick with a bunch of errors. And it also immediately takes the pressure off that backing service so that it doesn't get hit too hard. Um, so it's configured much like you know, a circuit breaker would be, you have an activation threshold that says, hey, don't even start listening until I have 10 messages through here. Um, set the trip hold as a percentage. If I'm getting 15% of the consumer messages as faulted, that's good enough to kill the endpoint. And then a timeout for the restart, whether that's minutes, hours, days, whatever. You can specify all those the same as a request timeout. Um, yeah, so pretty simple. You can configure it at the bus level and it affects the whole bus, or you can configure it for specific endpoints. Um, if you don't configure it for both, I mean, seriously, you're going to just kill yourself. Use a consumer definition or something like that to plug it in if you're going to try to do that but um, because then you would have two kill switches and you'd have two observers and it just kind of gets crazy so um, yeah definitely don't do that but you can figure the bus level or the endpoint level pretty easy uh, it does have you know again the optimi 
options for setting the activation restart timeout, you can filter exceptions. So you could say only restop the endpoint if you're getting these exceptions or ignore these exceptions because they're not, those need to go to the error queue. So you know, you're able to, you know, put the same granularity that you can with the retry message filters. So, you know, same configurability, same options, just uh, designed to stop the endpoint. It'll stop the endpoint, it'll start the endpoint up. As part of this, I found a nice little bug in the in-memory transport, so I had to tweak that to work better. And then I got this brilliant idea of trying to make the in-memory transport better, which might be some time down the line, but you know, nothing to do there. So, so that's it for, I'm gonna go into some code here in a second. This isn't just like a chit chat session. Um, I wanted to point out a couple of other new features. Discussions are live on the GitHub site. So if you're on Mass Transit's uh, GitHub repo, the discussions tab is hot, and you'll notice if you if you might you may have submitted an issue recently and seen it bumped over to discussions. Basically, this is great. It lets you know when people ask questions as an issue or just now they're starting to actually just ask questions through discussions, which has been great. Um, it makes it real easy for me to look at an issue and say this isn't an issue, but it's a valid question. I can bump it over to a discussion, and then it isn't the closed is not an issue type experience for the developers. So. I think this is a great addition. It's a real quick click for me to move stuff over into discussions. And, you know, it, is it a Stack Overflow experience? Kind of. I mean, it's, it's doing a lot of the same things. It's integrated with the repo. It's closely coupled to what Mass Transit is doing. So it, it makes it easy to find. Um, you do have to have a GitHub account, which I imagine a lot of people do. Stack Overflow is still a resource that we monitor and check regularly. So questions are always answered there as well. You know, I don't get fake internet points on GitHub, but, you know, I do on Stack Overflow, so, you know, there's always that. Um, but again, it's just about having multiple mediums for people to get support and get the help they need, so that's been good. Discord is still the best place for live chat, especially being home all the time. I'm usually always on Discord. It's crazy. Um, hey, Leonardo, welcome. Argentina, awesome. Yeah, time zones are always fun. I imagine, you know. Especially with, you know, I know a lot of people that are off work today, so it's, you know, kind of fun. Wow, two from Argentina. Awesome. That's great. Welcome. Um, so I wanted to kind of jump into some of the code that, you know, I have today just to kind of, and I apologize. I, I think the last live sessions I did were at the beginning of December, and I said more were coming. But unfortunately, Cyberpunk 2077 came out on the 10th of December, and I went dark for like a week finishing it. Um, it's a great game. If you're on console, I'm sorry, you got screwed. But if you're on PC and have the hardware, it is, it is absolutely, without a doubt, the best single-player RPG ever made. They say it's not an RPG, and it kind of has a lot of action-adventure stuff, but honestly, it's a fantastic game, and I have already almost 100 hours into it in just the week and a half I was playing it. So, yeah, it's like coding, because you can hack and everything. It's actually pretty fun. I was going to jokingly do a live stream on it in the middle, say this is why Mass Transit isn't getting any love right now. But, uh, but yeah, so it's fun. Oh, my gosh, we have Spanish speaking in the chat. <laughs> I have a friend who's learning Spanish, and like, oh, that would come in really handy, because I only understand the very basics. So that's awesome. Um, all right, so... I'm going to jump into a little bit of code. I have a little demo that I've created, and I want to try to put the kill switch into it. And I wanted to do it from scratch because I wanted to show an existing project. There was another comment and thread in Discord that came up a while back about mass transit performance with RPC compared to like HTTP and things like that. And so I have a little demo here. Uh, it's up and running in Docker. I, have a, I can show the Docker Compose. Um, I think it's in the parent folder. So I have, uh, oops, let's see if I can get this up in here. Which keys am I using here? Get it a little bigger. Make it bigger. How did I not make it bigger? I don't know. I don't remember any of this stuff. Um, but basically, I have two services. I have a front end service that's running ASP.NET Core. These are all .NET 5 services. Uh, running in Docker, one of them is a front end, and that front end has two ways to talk to it, by HTTP or by a RabbitMQ. And the front end talks to the back end. And the performance we're looking at is, how, you know, what's, what's the difference between using mass transit for RPC versus, over RabbitMQ versus using just straight up ASP.NET HTTP? Um, their num they reported that mass transit was faster. I've yet to see that number yet, but it's comparable to where 
I mean, let's face it, right now my consumers are doing nothing. So if you had any business logic in there, chances are the, the difference would be net zero. Uh, I just don't think you would see it. So then it's just a matter of tool sets and coupling. Uh, Mass Transit obviously makes it very easy to decouple. You don't have to know HTTP endpoints and manage HTTP clients and all that stuff. Um, but I have a back end and a front end running. I have RabbitMQ running in another Docker container. So this is all on Docker. So there's always, you know, that's what most production environments are going to be if they aren't already is people running these things on Kubernetes with multiple instances. So again, fun time stuff. Um, and if I run the benchmark, let me see what my benchmarks currently look like. I'm going to crank down these numbers a little bit. Just, you know, let's just make it like 4,000, not 40,000. <laughs> Just make it like 4,000 or 3,000 or something, something reasonable. I'm just using Apache Bench to benchmark this. So you can see, I don't know why my font isn't getting bigger. It should, but I don't know. Anyway, um, I'm using Apache Bench for the HTTP benchmarks. The first test is going HTTP all the way. So I call HTTP client front end, HTTP client to the back end, and basically just forming that nasty RPC chain that I hate so much. Um, the second one is actually calling the front end with HTTP, but then calling the back end with RabbitMQ. And then the third one is using a .NET client to do the, using the request client to actually send the request to the front end, which then sends a request to the back end and daisy chain it. So it's like nested RPC, which really sucks, but it's, it's something that people do and I wanted to get a comparison of it. It also gives me a sample to build on to show the kill switch shortly if I get there. Um, so if I just run this, yeah, I know, nested RPCs, all the suck. So if I just run this, and if I can crank this font up a little bit, we can see that um, I get, what I get? I get 2,000 requests a second on the first one, 1,100 requests a second on the second one, and 1,400 requests a second on the third. Oh, look, we got annoying spammer. How do I kill a spammer? <laughs> uh, how do I get rid of that person? Oh, they just spammed it. They don't even hang around in the chat. Yeah, that's awesome. I don't know how to delete that or moderate that. So, um, yeah, don't be clicking on viewers, buyers, whatever. It's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you know how to take care of it in Twitch chat? <laughs> I don't even know how to make you a mod. <laughs> I show moderation actions. Let's see here. Yeah, I'm not even going to get tied into that. Just disregard that annoying person. Oh, I see it. Uh, block. There we go. Bloop. All right. Hey, awesome. I don't know how to delete that chat, though. Yeah. Anyway, awesome. Great. Not going to mess with it. All right. Anyway. Um, so I, this, this ran the three tests in order. The first test was just HTTP to HTTP, no worries at all. Uh, and I see about to get 2,000 requests a second. So that's, that's about what I would expect. There, you know, it's non-durable. It's going over a well-optimized transport. This is all .NET 5 ASP.NET Core, so you know it's tweaked to hell by now. Uh, we're running on a 16 physical, 32 virtual core machine with un basically unlimited RAM, so it's not you know, hitting any sort of benchmarks. So, I mean, again, you're going to get pretty good loopback performance on that. Running through RabbitMQ, which in this case is set to non-durable for the front, for the back end, because it's just doing a validate on the order. It dropped down to 1100 a second and only doing 4,000 messages. That isn't really a whole lot of a test. I mean, but it, you know, I've seen it vary and go all the way as up to like 1800 a second. So again, you know, it just depends on load and how much tuning it gets. The, uh, and then the last one is the client, which is using RabbitMQ RPC all the way. So you see, I get like 1462 there, and I can run any of these individually if I just run them again, just to kind of see what difference I get. You can see I'm getting like 2800 a second HTTP. This time I got 1500 a second using a mix of the two. And then using just RabbitMQ's client, I'm getting 1650 a second. And again, these are just literal loopbacks. They just respond immediately. There isn't any work there. If I was actually doing work, and especially if I was like talking to a database, you could expect this throughput to be exactly the same for all of them. You know, if I put a task out delay of three milliseconds in there, they will all come out exactly the same because the network transport is not your bottleneck. 
So it's really just what tool chains you want to use. I mean, if you want to keep, you know, decoupled and keep message based, mass transit's a great way to do it. Um, this project is called Too Fast, because, you know, Too Fast, Too Furious, and my prop isn't present because I couldn't find it, but they used to have those great cans of NOS energy drink, and I'm a huge Fast and Furious fan, so this is my Too Fast. Yeah, but I, I can't find the energy drinks anymore. Apparently, you know, they kill people or something because there's so much stuff in them. Who knows? Um, but yeah, so it's, it's a pretty simple solution. It's up on GitHub, fatboyg slash too fast. Uh, it has the back end. It has the client. It has all the Docker set up. So all the services are running in Docker. The only thing I run on the local machine in this case is the, the client for calling into the service, same as I would do uh, from Apache Bench. So I'm going through that network layer. And it just does some, you know, I, you know, we can look at the simple controller here because what we're going to do is we're going to add the kill switch to this. And I'm trying to be mindful of time. I'm, uh, you know, I guess I'm live for 25 minutes now. Okay, great. Um, so the front end just has a single controller, the order controller. And this one is, again, just using HTTP client. I have a validate order service. All it's doing is checking the validation calling validate order, which if we look at validate order, it's going to do HTTP client post async to send the order through JSON content. Um, it is using that. So anybody who doesn't know, um, HTTP client factory, I'm trying to think how that's in. I think it's in startup. HTTP client factory, when you configure it, you can add an HTTP client, you give it a service name and it gives you a type factory. In this case, I'm just going over HTTP to the back end. Uh, and then I'm just able to, within the service, just call the validate order uh, path within that base path. So that's all using HTTP client factory, which is pretty cool. It's a great way to register your HTTP clients in the container. And then you know they're cached properly and you don't have to deal with disposal and all that garbage. Um, so that's one of the controllers. And that's the one that just does HTTP. The RabbitMQ order controller, it uses the request client. Uh, so again, it's not using HTTP, it's, doing, it's calling that back end through RabbitMQ. Um, and it's using the request client with the get response. I'm actually using the pattern matching type, so you know, it's going down to order. I don't, I don't think there's really any measurable performance difference between the two, but this is just checking at the response and saying it was either okay, unprocessable, or a problem. Um, and that's just, you know, the difference there. If I, um, if I go into... The contracts are just, you know, basic message contracts. Of course, now with .NET 5, we can use record. So I have these init property records that I'm sending. So taking advantage of all those fancy new language features, always a good time. Um, my consumer on the back end is the validate order consumer. Um, again, it's just looking at the order toll. Yeah, records, I know they're here. They're, 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 they're fancy. They, they have all the language features we would want. Um, again, this is just a dumb order checker. It's just basically it just always responds order validated unless you do something stupid. Um, yeah. So I one of the <clears throat> excuse me one of the things I wanted to do as part of this test now is I have this here and I have this test rig up. I wanted to um, I'm going to kill the Docker front end and this project is also great for if you want to just see how to do Docker builds and with Docker Compose and everything. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually put a new consumer in the back end. I'm going to add a new consumer. And I'm going to call this the, um, I don't know, let's just call it something fun. Let's just call it the process order consumer. I don't think I have one of those anywhere. Um, and we will, I consumer, and this is just on the fly because I just want to create something that, that I can use. To show how this works. So let's go look at validate order. And we're just going to make something very similar. We're just going to call it process order. And we're just going to give it something like an order ID. And what we're trying to do here is we're just trying to send some messages to a consumer at a very high rate. And the reason for that will be pretty clear pretty soon. We will say if context dot <clears throat> message dot, let's see here. Do I use random anywhere? I don't think I do. Let's just throw, <laughs> let's just make it fun. 
We are going to fail because the road is closed. Great. Because we want to be a bad consumer. We're going to fail. And I want to create a consumer definition for this. So process order consumer definition. If I can spell. You notice I remembered to put presentation assistant on today. So all those crazy keystrokes, although they broke it. Why is the command key now called meta? That's just really annoying. I put an issue on their thing. It's like, it's a command key. Call it a command key. Meta is dorky. Not that I'm opinionated or anything. Um, but on here, I want to do the use kill switch. And I'm going to put my settings. This is using kind of the options style that I have with like job service options and others. So, you know, always fun. I'm going to set the activation threshold at 10. Actually, I'm just going to call Yeah, activation threshold equals 10. Options dot, uh, I'm not going to filter anything. Let's just set the restart timeout equal set restart timeout. You'll notice I had, let's just restart after 10 seconds. I have these. This is actually a pretty handy little helper. I, I you know, some people think it's funky, but I don't know how to get it to show up. But it's like, it's all optional arguments like seconds, days, hours, minutes, milliseconds. And so you can just specify what you want. It's easier than time span from seconds being spread out everywhere. Um, tracking period, trip threshold. Hey, long time no see, Brave Cobra 2. Welcome to the video. We're going over uh, setting up the kill switch on a consumer within one of the new samples. So we'll just say 15%. It doesn't matter because every message is going to fail. Um, so we'll move that over. Wherever we get the validate order, I think we do add consumers on this. Yeah, add consumers from namespace. So it's automatically going to bring that consumer in for us. So that's all good. Um, if I run that, we would see that. So with that in place and that with the kill switch on it, we should see that run. What I want to do now is I want to go tweak the client and I'm going to, I'm just going to change this locally because I want to, you know, basically break it. Um, so I'm going to extract this out. Um, benchmark RPC. Okay. So that's what I normally do, but now I'm just going to pump a ton of messages in here. So I'm going to do this the way that I absolutely love to do. I'm just going to say, how many messages should we do? Let's just do uh, const int. Are you all nicks? Oh, nicknames? Yeah, I don't know who everybody is. Everybody has a nickname. Um, let's just set the message count equal to, let's set it to a thousand. Why not a thousand? We can definitely break at a thousand. Um, let's just set it at a hundred for now, not get overboard. Um, and all we're going to do is we're going to say publish plus dot publish new process order. And we'll give it an order ID of newid.nextquid. Great. A couple extra. Do I need some more? What do I need? Tell me what I need. All right, great. And all this is going to do is going to throw 100 messages in the queue so that they're all being processed. So that will give me something to run within the client. I know who Code with Sean is. <laughs> That's an easy one. We have a couple people from Argentina. We have. I can't remember where Brave Cobra is from, but yeah. So yeah, so Brave Cobra, this is, so with Math Transit 711, I released the kill switch, which is like a circuit breaker, but for messaging. So, you know, circuit breaker, as I said, is a great way to fill your error queue if you wanna just say everything fails. What the kill switch does is it will actually stop the receive endpoint, so you stop processing messages, giving that backing service a chance to recover or come back up, so. That's what we're kind of adding in here now is, you know, we've, we've got the benchmark RPC that we're not going to run now. We're actually just going to pump a bunch of messages into the queue. Make sure this builds. Okay, it looks good. And yeah, you get your kill switch. Yeah, it's called kill switch, but you still get your circuit breaker, you know, merit badge. So you can still be like all the cool kids. 
So we'll docker compose build to get both of those services running. And I will go ahead and once that fires up, see if we can get RabbitMQ running. This actually does the staged build off uh, using the new not .NET 5 uh, Docker images, which are up there, which are actually just .NET now, not .NET slash core slash ASP.NET. They took that out because core is apparently out of vogue. It's, it's just .NET now. Um, and so once those are spun up, RabbitMQ is up, the services are up. I should be able to see RabbitMQ running. So if I go in and look at the guest, I should be able to see the queues that were created. I have that new process order queue right here. It's durable. It has a consumer. I have a prefetch of 16. Everything's rocking and rolling. Um, but if we look at the channels, look at the queues, let's just stay in process order and then look at this channel. Because this channel is what my consumer's on, and those are the consumers. Um, so this is up and running. Now let me go run that client. Um, Get my command line here. Because I just want to run that. That's going to put 100 messages in the queue. Should go pretty quick. And you can see my consumer is now gone. And if I look here in the Docker Compose, you can see I got errors. And if I scroll up or down or around or somewhere, I should see a message that it killed the endpoint. Um, I think I only have this on fail right now, so I don't have it on info, but it might be a warning. But it will write a message to the log that says, hey, I'm killing the receive endpoint because it was bad. Uh, and then it will try to progressively turn it back on. And let's see here. Is there a way to search in the console? <laughs> yeah, I think my log level's at fail only, so it isn't gonna show the info. So a question in the chat, will it still process the last received message or just stop? So any message in flight when you receive and stop a receive endpoint is going to complete. So basically it waits for the in process messages to finish and so it can act or knack those. And then, um, and then once those are done, that's just part of the receive endpoint shutting down. So you can see that it keeps trying to come back up and it immediately goes back down because my consumer never gets successful. Um, I should probably change it so like I get, you know, 100 good messages, but you can see it like ramps up. There's a seesaw here. It's like, I tried, I tried, I tried, I tried, and it hits that trip threshold and immediately shuts back down. Looks like we finally chewed the queue because there's nothing left and the consumer will stay connected now because it's back up and there's no messages. So it's, it isn't failing, and so in the presence of no failure, it's going to leave it up and running. Um, so yeah, so that's basically what happened, is it's back up and running now because the queue is empty. If I put another 100 messages in there, it would run a bunch of those and then immediately shut down again because the consumer right now is hard-coded default. Um, and I can't think of a nice, fun way to make it not fault. So. But just to give you, a percent, give you an idea of how that kill switch works. And it's great because you can specify the timeouts. It shows up in the health. If I go to, and I couldn't get this to come up. I think it's localhost 5002 slash. I don't think I configured health endpoints. Yeah, I don't think I'm configuring health endpoints in my services because, yeah, I'm not. If I were configuring health endpoints, I could see that the bus is unhealthy but I didn't configure one, so it's not there. Um, I guess I could go steal that code from somewhere. I'm trying to think where that code is. Did it actually give me a 404 or did it give, okay, so it gave me a 404. So if I go to sample Twitch, I think that's in here somewhere. Uh, sample API, if I go to startup, I think I configure health here. Yeah, look at that, map health endpoints. So if I go back to my, let's go over to Docker, kill that back end. Let's go to my startup for the back end and go down here to this. That should resolve, great, ready, map health ready, health live. Okay, great. That should add the health checks that we need. Uh, looks like no errors, so we'll, Rebuild that, get that up and running. This takes a second for both those to build, deploy the containers, and then restart. Get the broker back up. 
Broker should be back. Consumers should be connected at some point. Okay, consumers connected. So now if I go here and look at this, okay, so I'm healthy, awesome. Now if I go to the client, knock another 100 messages in there, I'll just keep refreshing here. It's still showing healthy, still showing healthy, still showing healthy. Not good, it should be showing degraded. Can I configure health checks on this? Should have. No consumers, but it's showing healthy. That doesn't sound good. I have to look at that. I don't think I configured health right on my point. Oh, did it, I think it threw when it started. Well, yeah, it threw a truckload of errors right now, but um, you're saying right when it started out? No, the health is working. It just isn't showing, and it's showing the bus is healthy. It just isn't showing the right stuff for some reason. I'm wondering why it isn't there. I'll have to check that separately. It should be showing unhealthy when the consumer isn't running. Of course, now it's probably back up. No? No consumer. Oh, huh. I have to look at that one. Where's my startup? Add mass transit using RabbitMQ. That should add the health checks. I wonder why they aren't picking up. Interesting. Probably broke something. Figures. Version of my own. No, I'm on 7.12 develop, so it should be the latest. Huh. I have to get somebody to look at that, and by somebody, I mean probably me, but there's something definitely going on there. It should be working. Um, wonder why. Anyway, we'll get there. We'll figure it out. Um, anyway, we're at about like 40 minutes. Um, I don't know if there's any questions in the chat. You're certainly welcome to throw it up. I have time to keep going if anybody wants to see something specific, but that's kill switch. That's how it works. Uh, I'll update this code so that that additional thing is part of there and maybe put a command line argument in the client to be able to tell it what to do, but it's just a simple push of a bunch of messages to the queue. Um, but yeah, the whole point of being able to, to shut down a receive endpoint when the world gets in a bad place is pretty key. As you'll see, it'll actually process and then it'll just stop. Like, then it'll come back up. Oh, yeah, I bet you're right. I bet there's something else I missed. Let's see what we got here. What did I forget up here? Oh, yeah, this one. That? Maybe that's what I need. It's an ASP.NET thing, so it's probably something I don't entirely know. Um, I have that. But I need this. Is that what we're saying here? Ah, yeah, okay. So maybe I'm not actually checking it. We'll find out if that fixes it. We'll go kill this. Um, should I make my consumer? Oh, I was going to change the logging level so that I could actually see the uh, see the um, the warnings. So let's just set mass transit to information. I think I need to update it here too because I don't think development actually ends up out there when I build it with Docker for release and publish it. Um, okay. Looks like it's going to build. Great. Put that new health check thing. We'll go out here and run it again. See if we get it. I don't know if we have any message in the queue, but it's going to take a second for this to come back up. It looks like I had 36 when I killed it. But it's reconnecting because obviously when I took the Docker down, it lost RabbitMQ also. Oh, yep. Now it's reconnecting. Waiting for data. That's still has four messages. It must have died again. Oh, yeah. See, there it is. Last message we see. Kill switch stopped endpoint. Restarting at. And it puts the restart interval there. So, yep. We're able to see that we killed the endpoint. All was good. Great. And now it's back up. Cool. So yeah, we get a nice little message when the kill switch stopped it. Obviously the health should be set right. We'll, uh, let's see if the health is coming up. Okay, it shows healthy. We'll find out. It might be something else weird with the, the health that I'll have to look into, but if we look at the log. This one we should see. Okay, so the kill switch stopped the endpoint. Yeah, it's still showing healthy, but something's wrong there. 
I'll have to take a look at that. It might be something that got broken with the health changes. But uh, anyway, so that's what we have. Some cool stuff in 7.1. Pretty excited about it. Um, yeah, the kill switch, it's just something that's needed to be there. I mean, monitoring services, just having the service self-monitor and self-protect itself is, is pretty cool, especially not having to move half a million messages from the error queue back to the processing queue. So, all right. Thanks a lot for joining. Uh, appreciate all the comments and questions and uh, have a good end of the year and a happy new year. And we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.